will evoke some conversation. Uh, so I'll try my best to have some uh, simple takeaways from each of our uh, nightly sessions, but at the same time, I hope that there's something that's brought to the table for us to be in conversation about. And though I may um, provide more questions than I will answer, so I hope that there's some answers in there from the presentation that I have. What I'm hoping, inshallah, for the two weeks that um, I'm here spending this time with you, the first week to be oriented around um, welcoming the month of Ramadan. The month of Ramadan, of course, is it's a full month, which is both uh, not a long time, but also it is 30 days. Uh, to take some time to appreciate really what we're getting ourselves into, I think, is, uh, is important. Uh, because once we get into the second half of the month, and especially the last 10 days, uh, we know that more or less to be the business end of things. We're there to ask Allah for the things we need most in life. We're there to secure our forgiveness. Um, salvation is maybe not a word that we use appropriately in an Islamic context, but we're there to secure something about this life and the next. But leading up to that, I think there's, uh, there's an opportunity to really focus our attention. We know from our uh, tradition that the month of Ramadan is a month that Allah is the host. We are guests in the banquet of God. And being a host, of course, requires a certain set of etiquettes, and Allah being the host, it's not really upon us to think about that or to, to dictate anything. But being a guest also has a certain set of etiquettes, right? So one of the things that I'm encouraging myself and all of you to think about as we have been welcomed to this month, of what are the etiquettes that are appropriate for a guest when it comes to this month of Ramadan, right? How are we presenting ourselves for going to the house of God, the banquet of God, uh, what is it that we're hoping to gain? What is it that we're hoping to achieve? And how is it that we're going to conduct ourselves in this month that makes us a good guest? So in the first week, inshallah, I'll be focusing our, our conversations around the 44th dua from as saifatu Sajjadiyah. saifatu Sajjadiyah, of course, has many duas for many different occasions. The 44th one is one specifically the Imam has recited in welcoming the month of Ramadan. Now, it's not a very long dua which means we can read it in the span of maybe 10, 15 minutes. But what we'd like to do in the reflections over this week, maybe five days, six days, is to uh, provide a little bit of commentary and just to kind of take our time as we go through it. What is the Imam saying about the month that is worthy of our attention, worthy of our reflection? So I really won't spend much time on introduction to the Sahifa. This is a practicing community. It's a learned community. So because of that, this doesn't need to serve as an introduction to the importance of the Sahih Fatih Sajjadiyah. But a reminder, as we see in interactions that we have with other Muslims, these are gems uh, that are in our possession. And uh, it's really a reminder for us to try and do justice to the resources that we have um, at our disposal. One of the... Uh, anecdotes that's shared by uh, one of our scholars, um, the late Sayyid Mar Ashi Najafi. If you visited Qom, you may know his uh, grand library, which was, uh, which was and may still be one of the largest in the region, Islamic libraries and library in the region. He, of course, had correspondence with many ulama from other schools of thought. And in one of the interactions he has with the Grand Mufti of Egypt, Sayyid uh, at Tantawi, in the uh, mid-80s, mid uh, he gifts this Sahifat al-Sajjadiyah to him and extends almost like as a, as a point of respect and as a point of conversation that this is one of the books that we revere and this of course belongs to, it's attributed to the Ahlul Bayt, you have great reverence, I wanted to share this with you. We have similar cases with Nahj al too, but when this uh, Grand Mufti and the Imam of Al-Azhar receives this book, this is the comment that he gives and I'm quoting, he says, it's indeed a, an extreme misfortune that up until now, we have failed to become acquainted with this eternal and priceless book that is from the bequest of the Holy Prophet and his pure family. Whenever I glance into it, I realize that these are words higher than that of the creation and lower than that of the creator. Right? So we have a similar sort of expression also about Najib al But basically, it's to say, not only is this a valuable book and maybe a, a point of support for our way of life and our attachment to Ahlul Bayt, it's also a source of instruction for us. If an outsider looks to this and says, wow, you know, you have something so 
invaluable here. It's upon us to kind of take seriously what's here. All right. A few introductory points about du'a. Uh, it's very possible that a common attitude, a popular attitude and perception towards du'a is a request that we're making from God. This is correct, but it's incomplete. If we look at du'a and the reciting of du'a simply as a means of making requests to God. What does du'a mean? Du'a in its most basic form is a call out to someone. And when we call out what we're doing, we're trying to get the attention of another person. Right? Now either we need something from them or they need something from us, but we're intentionally trying to establish some sort of communication or relationship. And the way that we do this is a little different from other forms of establishing communication. We also have munajat. Munajat are those whispered prayers, right? They're an intimate sort of communication where you're either in such close proximity to the individual or the issue is so sensitive that you have to express yourself in a secretive or intimate fashion. But the basic point is this. If dua is a call out to someone or something, if we are reading dua, there have to be some basic questions that we're asking. First of all, are we truly calling out to God? Okay. Number one. So you have to be intentional in your call. If I call this brother, oh brother, and he looks to me, and I don't have anything to say. He's going, to go, what's wrong with you? Do you need something from me? So when we're making that call to God, we're, at, we're calling out to God, what's the intention behind it? Why are we trying to secure God's attention? The second thing is, something is asked. Something is said. What are we saying to God? What is it that we want to communicate to God? If we are asking something, what are we asking for? If we are sharing something, what are we sharing? For what reason? One of the, I think, barriers that we can break through for someone like myself, it's possible many of you, if not a majority of you, have already broken through these barriers, but to try and get to a more refined practice of Islam. To break through the barrier of thinking of du'a simply as a medium to secure some sort of worldly or otherworldly benefit. Right? Du'a is not simply a means for us to list the things that we want God to do for us. And if we move past that, then we'll look at the multitude of du'a that we have at our disposal in that literature. It serves a purpose more than just that. Right? Specifically in the context of the, the Sahifa Tasajjadi, we all know because we are students of the, um, the school of Karbala and the Ahlul Bayt, this was written in, in, in a context where the Imam was intentionally working towards instructing the community, but through a means that attracted less attention. Right? The Imam could not set up a school where he could teach people, teach them the truth, compare other ways of living, other ways of learning. He does it through a strategic means of du'a. So even more than other sources that we may have, the Sahifa for sure serves as a medium of education and a medium of guidance. So let us look at it not only as a means to secure some blessing and to request things from God, but also as a source of teaching, and a source of guidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Call on me and I will answer you. So there's already a, an, a an affirmation, there's an assurance. If you, may, if you make a call to God, and it's not even the right or wrong way, you will receive a response, right? You don't have to wait for you know, the, the, check, the double check boxes to come next to the message to see that God has received and seen your message. The call will always be received and the call will always be responded to. That's something we have to take for granted. So, the function of dua is then this. Number one, is to request something from God. And number two, like we're saying, to penetrate past simply asking, is to try and be in conversation with Allah. And in being in conversation, again, you want to move past the formalities, right? You're not writing God an email to request certain things. You're trying to engage in a type of conversation that you can speak your mind, you can speak your heart, you can be authentic. And let's just have a simple moment of reflection like, how frequently do we really have conversations with people that we feel like we can be authentic 
in our conversation. Because we're not, it's not utilitarian in that we're ser it, it serves some end, right? If I converse in a business setting, I'm doing that because it's a requirement of my job. It's needed for me to advance whatever you know, projects that I'm working on, whatever responsibilities that I have. It's imposed. If I didn't need to, I may not have done it. Conversations that I have with friends. A lot of times there's pleasantries, there's chit chats, there's catching up, those are good things. With family, how, how much of that though do we feel like we're expressing ourselves, we're sharing who we are, we're sharing how we're feeling. There's a level of authenticity and vulnerability that's there. If we look at research in social sciences, psychology, we'll see that there's a, a clear need for authentic communication and authentic self-expression. We're living in a world that is, it's incredibly connected and it continues to be connected, but at the same time there's isolation in the connection that we have. We live in a global world and in the last 150, 200 years, we're able to establish connections and be in conversation with people all over the world that previously we could not be. But that doesn't mean that we are connecting with them, that we are establishing relationships with them, we are expressing ourselves to them. So as we grow in our global footprint, also our sense of isolation, research is showing is also increasing. And this is particularly true in an American context. America is one of the cultures that ranks highest on its individualism, right? We work together incredibly efficiently, but we live individually. So the du'a is helping us, it's training us, and especially in a month like this, it is teaching us how we can express ourselves and the importance of self-expression and how it is that we should express ourselves in a, an Islamic context. So if you look at uh, research in positive psychology, this is budding fields within human behavior and human emotions, uh, we'll find that if we're able to truly understand like, who we are as a person and then express ourselves, articulate ourselves, communicate ourselves, express our emotions, assert ourselves, we're able to establish more meaningful relationships. And it's, it's incredibly impactful in our own physical well-being and our mental well-being. Right? We live in a time of a mental health crisis or epidemic. And it's not because this thing started yesterday and we're dealing with it now. It's that we're, there's a growing appreciation of something like that. If we don't express ourselves though, and of course we find ourselves in an incredibly difficult situation, stressful situations, our mind, our brain, our body, psychologists will tell us, will find itself in one of two positions. Right? It's, a, it's a basic orientation. Either you'll fight or you'll flight, right? This fight or flight mode is a, a basic binary that exists because of the physical reactions that our body undergoes when we're in a difficult situation where we don't know how to express ourselves. So to take our mind briefly in this place, when we're talking about like our our authentic expression of Islam, right? Each and every one of us has a basic conception of what Islam is and what Islam calls us to. Yes, there are some basic affirmations that we make. I believe God is one. I believe uh, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, is a messenger of God. I believe that the Ahlul Bayt are the true recipients of the prophetic and the divine guidance, the Walai, all those things. Those are affirmations that you're making. But what is Islam calling you to? How is Islam defining meaning in your life? Now imagine if you're not able to express yourself, you're not able to be in an authentic conversation with that call, you'll find yourself in a, one of these basic positions, fight or flight, right? You're either going to fight it, you're going to have a reaction that is not productive or constructive. It's not conducive to your growth. That's one phenomenon we see in religious practice and in some religious communities. It seems not to gel with who they are and what they want to do. They don't know how to engage with it properly, so they're adversary. So we have this adversarial relationship. A lot of times with younger generations, parents may experience this. Either the religious practice as a whole or their understanding of what a religious practice should be doesn't seem to line up with the way that they experience the world. So they fight with it. 
the parent's stuck. What can I do to get my child to accept this way of life, this way of practice? Another orientation is flight. It's not worth it. I can't accomplish anything. I'm not strong enough. I'm not capable enough. And they more or less just discount and dismiss it. Let me strive for things that I feel like I'm more capable towards, that are more achievable to me. We also see this, it's a very broadly observed, again, within religious communities and Muslim communities, especially you know, in, the Western, in the Western world. Why are my children not religious? Why do my children not care to come to the masjid? These are all important questions. They're pointed questions. But to have an appreciation of why we are in a position like this, it's, it's, I think it's important for us to take some of these into account. So the da'a is helping us express ourselves. The da'a is helping us come to terms with what it means to be in conversation with God. What is it that Islam is asking us to do? And what is our response to that in a way that we are truthful and authentic? This is important because, again, we live in a world that we are increasingly engineered to think in certain ways and to act in certain ways. Imagine, if, you're, if we're responsible to work for our own self-expression and we want to be creative in our self-expression, it requires us to think critically, right? The, the larger questions in life. What was I created for? You know, Islam says in uh, Nasr al-Balagh, it's an attribution to Imam Ali, he says, may God have mercy on the person who knows where they came from, where they are, and where they're going. These are the three perennial rudimentary questions of life. Where did you come from? Why are you here? Or what are you doing? And where are you going? If you have the answer to these three questions, you have a basic life plan. Your life has meaning, your life has purpose. So for us in our expression, our self-expression, we're engaging with these kind of questions, right? And Islam is presenting to us some answers to these. How are we responding to it? First, are we having a fight or flight mentality? Second, in our expression towards these questions, are we being creative and constructing organic responses to that? Or are we simply choosing from the options that exist? Now, why do I mention that? Just observe the type of kind of life and society that we live in. We're generally programmed to work within a certain set of you know, accepted realities and truths. This is how the world works. That's already telling us that there's no reason to rethink or reimagine the way the world is working. Only when we find ourselves in times of crisis do we say, oh, what's going on here? Right now, climate change, ecological crisis, these are not new ideas, right? Do we just learn right now that we should care for the planet? No. It's gotten so out of hand that now we're thinking, well, how did we get to this point and what do we need to do to change? But if that was always, if there was always a push to think a little bit more outside the box and move beyond some of the options that are made presentable, a person should say, well, you know, I'm living, you know, not just with other peoples, but I'm living with other things, other creations. As much as I have a responsibility to other people, I have a responsibility towards the world. When we go out to eat, when we go out to, to work, there are some defined kind of like positions and actions and choices. And our autonomy, our, our creativity is only exercised insofar as we choose one of these options. Right? Think of how you want to entertain yourself. Think of how you want to relax in life. I bet we can count on, our, on one hand the activity that the vast majority of people do here. One is they probably watch some sort of media, right? TV, internet, some show. Maybe they engage in some sort of reading. A lot of times they're just engaging in, on their phones. And the last thing, maybe they, they go out and visit other peoples and maybe engage with nature. Is that really a creative way of expressing how you can satisfy a need that you have? And with the younger generation, it's even worse, right? When they go to school, what are they teaching them? I know we speak about, bemoan about the need for creative thinking, critical thinking, problem solving, but rea in reality, what is the underlying basic educational theory? Right? The philosophical education that John Dewey established in American schools is the person who goes to school needs to become a good worker. They need to become an efficient worker. So worker, yes, there's maybe some creative development that needs to be there to solve problems, but basically, you have a certain set of functions, you need to do them very well. So you're taught to do them. Your conception of the world revolves around certain predefined categories. So you, you're really good at like turning this knob, so you go become an engineer. 
you're like really good at like solving this calculus. You go become like a mathematician. You're really good at like connecting with people. You go, go become a counselor. But is there really an opportunity for the person to think how it is that they want to express themselves? So du'a is, is, is more than just, all right, let me take 10 minutes and read this Arabic and hope for the best. It's an attempt to try and engage with some of these very basic questions about what we're doing in life and what we want to achieve. So there's two things to keep in mind when we're reviewing this du'a. Number one, what are we asking Allah for? It's a, it's a real question. And I know we're reading the du'a, there's, we're going to recite it, which means the imam is already asking for certain things. The question is, why are we asking for these things? What are we asking Allah for? What are those things that are mentioned one after another? And number two, in the requests that we're making in the form of the du'a, what are we asking of ourselves? What are we asking of ourselves? Right? So to be in a conversation, an authentic conversation, it's not just about looking at the other and making a request from them. So I think we have what, what, four minutes. All right, four minutes. Let's read the first line. All right, and try to apply some of these basic orientations and attitudes. The Imam begins like this: Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, ladi hadana lihamdi. All praise belongs to Allah that guided us to His praise. Wajalana min ahlihi, and made us from amongst his people, his children, his collective, his community. So that we may be through his beneficence, his kindness, his mercy from amongst the thankful. And so that he may recompense us for that thankfulness, the recompense of the good doers. So that's the, the first of maybe like 30 lines that we have in the du'a, okay? So the imam is establishing praise to God who has made us of the praiseful, okay? So what are we saying to God? What, is, what does that sentence right there mean? What have I just said? We can praise God, okay. What does that say about me? that I'm thanking God for Him making me among the praisers of Him? That's a more difficult question to answer. And thank you, Allah, for making me from amongst your people. Okay, okay well, well, God is merciful, God guides, so He decided to make us, you know, that's His function. Well, what does that say about us, that we were made a part of this community, that we were made a part of this nation, that we were made a part of this people? And this one thing to think about for tomorrow. Through the kindness that God has shown us and, and positioned us this way, that we may be among the thankful. Right? Okay. So we're expressing that, you know, God, you've done this in the expectation that we be of the thankful ones. So that's what we're saying to God. But what are we asking of ourselves? What are we asking in our thankfulness to God? And that's the question we want to explore tomorrow. First of all, in the positioning of us being Muslim, is that making us people who are engaging in things? That's the first one. Number two, why is it important that we may be of the thankful people? And please, like I said, try to move past some of the more, you know, cookie cutter answers. Well, you know, it's good to give thanks because it's the nice thing to do, the right thing to do. That's a good answer. Those are good, those are good Saturday school answers. And even your children are, they're nuancing those responses much more every day. And the third thing, what, is it, what does it look like to give thanks? Here it's not saying give thanks to God. It's just saying being of the thankful ones. What does it mean for us to be of the thankful ones? It's a basic idea, but honestly, if we unpack something like this, many of the, the, the truths that we're searching for, many of the knots that we find ourselves experiencing in life, we can untie them, we can uncover them. Doesn't require us to read du'a after du'a after du'a, page after page after page. If we just take our time and focus, there's a lot of really good, I think, answers that we can find and realizations that we can uncover, inshallah. And that's the purpose that we're trying to do. We may not finish the du'a, but we're hoping that we take the time to explore it and appreciate it. So my ask is for tomorrow, inshallah, the du'a is accessible. 
You have a phone, you have access to the internet, you have access to a, a, a library, a DAW manual, the DAW is there. L look through the DAW very briefly. Number two, read the first few lines in preparation for tomorrow. And third, think about this idea of what it means to be thankful. Are you thankful? What does it mean for you to be thankful? How are you thankful? Why is that important, inshallah? We'll pick up tomorrow night, inshallah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.